Kia ora katou. Um, this is going to be partly a coordination test for me because I will need my notes and they are in here. <laughs> and I've got to drive this. Um, yep, so I'm Ngāti Pakia, probably worked that out. Um, Danish and Scottish background, so just really embedded um, with the sea because uh, we're Vikings. Um, and I guess that's you know, it's centuries ago, but it stays with us because it's just a fundamental part of who we are. So today, first test, I'm here on behalf of these people. This is our research team um, who, who did all this mahi over the last actually five years and, and it's, 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 it's a lot. Um, but just to give credit where credit's due, Liz McPherson and Baby 4.2, our project was called 4.2. Margot actually was born during the project, so we just called her Baby 4.2. Um, was uh, really the, the lead of this work. We're called co leaders. Liz is the leader, she's the thought provoker. Um, Karen Fisher, Auckland University social scientist. Andrew Allison, really interesting guy, eh? Like, left Aotearoa at 16 and went professional kickboxing in Thailand for five or six years and came home and worked for the Reserve Bank, worked in the insurance industry and is a really gun modeler now, and other things as well. Um, Judy Hewitt, um, marine ecologist. Hamish Rene, a lecturer in resource management, fisheries, and other stuff at Lincoln University. Julia Talbot-Jones came on the second half of our project. Julia's another really interesting background, but her skills that she brought to us were around Psychological, ecological economics, I'm going to call it. I just made that up, but that's where her strengths are. Um, Steve Ehrlich, Lincoln University, uh, used to be coastal scientist in Marlborough. He's a lecturer on resource management, um, ecology. Adrian Paul, uh, Canterbury University. From here, from um, Motano Island, oh, not Motano, Motiri, sorry, I keep getting confused. And me, and my moko. And it's just me, um, is, is what I call myself, just me. Because um, like, Kirsty said a little bit of how I got to be here. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a policy person, I'm not a planner. Um, but what I actually did, uh, what I've been doing is just like, how can this be so bad? How can people make such poor decisions looking after our place on our behalf? So I started to look at that through my corporate background, hey, because we, we can put structures and things in place and I'll put everything in their boxes and we'll fix it all. That was like 20, 25 years ago. Um, yeah, I was really arrogant and really ignorant and actually quite foolish. Um, interesting listening to earlier because one of the things we started was a thing called the Marlborough Sounds Integrated Management Trust. It's got to be as simple as getting everyone talking together. Yes and no. Um, because, like, I was born, when I was born, Waikawa looked like that. Today, Waikawa looks like that. And, and to me, I mean, that's, yeah, that's my, my place where I stand, right? But that's symptomatic of a lot of what's been happening around Aotearoa. And, and this level of development, activity and things like that is actually sacrificing the very thing we need to survive. And you'd think that'd be an imperative in its own right. No, <laughs> not so much. But that actually, and so these are some of the things that are going on in Marlborough at the moment, today. Um, and they're happening all around the country, all around Aotearoa. You know, we have these types of issues going on and more. We've just got such a level of activity, it's poorly managed and it's unsustainable. And it doesn't actually need to be that way. That's one of the things and so, which interested me when I got the opportunity to become involved in this thing, is how can we do, and so we take ecosystem-based management as a given, and there's a whole lot of principles, there's seven, not a whole lot actually, there's seven principles that the challenge have developed around that. I encourage you to go and look at them if you're not familiar with them. What are our opportunities to implement ecosystem-based management within, within existing Western law and policy? Okay, now, Scope and context of our work is, is actually very important. It's within existing legislation and policy. It's opportunities. So we don't tear it apart, but we say, with what is already there, here's how we can do better. 
Okay, it's actually starting that journey of progression. There needs to be other parallel journeys going to actually improve our legislation and policy, and in particular, dealing with our fundamental constitutional issues. Because we can't get where we need to go until we've dealt with those fundamental constitutional issues. Full stop. It's, it's just not possible. But let's not do nothing in the meantime. Um, so that's where we're at. And vis-a-vis -vis these fundamental constitutional issues around te reti ranga te reitanga, using a mataranga and existing in, in the context of law and policy, you know, there's a whole lot of other good work in the, in the challenge and beyond looking at that. And we're, we're not in a place, we don't have the background, the knowledge to do that. Um, but there is a problem with my clicker team, keyboard. Okay, I think it's frozen. No, no, just push harder. Push hard. Um, so th they're just some of the projects, but you've got Beth, Lara, R Robert Joseph, um, Dan, John Reed from Canterbury University doing some great work in these areas. So we've left them alone. Our lane is how do we use existing Western, you know, really focusing on that law and policy to, to get better outcomes. Um, so like, I'm going to say a whole lot of stuff after this. These are the important, <laughs> this, is, this is where we end up though. It's kind of where we started and where we end up. We've got all that research, then we're going to change these policies, going to change that, and then we go, yeah, do we need to though, really? Because um, actually, our existing laws and policies, regulations, are very enabling. Very enabling. They don't stop us doing too many things. Um, people administering them do. But the rules themselves don't, right? Um, and we've done some goodish some good things with them, but we're kind of ad hoc in how we do it. It's not consistent. It's not part of a bigger plan. Um, they're not utilised. They're not fully utilised. We'll do a bit here because the politics of the day is comfortable with it or the leadership of the day is comfortable with it, but we seldom see them right through and it doesn't become ingrained. They're kind of like one-off activities instead of an opportunity to keep getting better and better and better. The laws and policies, the words in them don't stop us doing that stuff. But that means we've got all these suboptimal outcomes. Witness Exhibit A earlier, those types of things happening all around the motu. Um, we can do significant, we can get significantly better outcomes for people in place with the right willingness and resources in the right place. We can, and we can't ignore the resources thing. Um, a lot of the resource issues, again, context, law and policy and how we're implementing that in Aotearoa and New Zealand currently, a lot of the disconnect we found is between central and regional government. Regional councils, you know, not perfect by any stretch, but they're also fundamentally under-resourced. And, and oftentimes national policy is, is pushing them in directions where they'd rather not go. Um, and again, I, I keep reinforcing these, is, is that you know, we can do better, put some resources in the right place, use it in a more appropriate, use our existing laws and policies in an appropriate manner, but fundamentally there needs to be some change at, at, at a, I, I use the term fundamental and Liz went, absolutely, Liz the lawyer, said that means constitutional change, Eric. Okay, good, kapai. Um, I'll take your word for that, but that's what we need. It's just having a moment, eh? There we go. Oh, gone again. Sorry, this is going to keep happening, team. I'm going to take you through our research process now. We had a very similar setup to Beth series of research outputs, structured our research the way it was meant to be structured, I was told, um, by the researchers. Um, first thing we did, international lit literature review, international and local, um, into ecosystem-based management and how people are going with it. And so what did we find out? We found that no one around the world is doing ecosystem-based management well. 
and every jurisdiction around the world has the similar issues that we have in Aotearoa around Indigenous rights and law. Full stop. Is that comforting or not? Probably not so much. Um, out of that, um, we also found, sorry, things like fragmentation, sectorial based approaches to law. So we have all these laws, but we've created them to deal with this and deal with that and deal with that. So it's not integrated across them, but does it have to be? Surely that's something that we can do as it administers of that law, users of that law. You know, we don't have to create one big law. This is a fundamental finding, I'm probably jumping ahead, but you know, it actually is complicated, but it's not. We've made it complicated because we've got so many laws. If we just try and fix that by putting all those same laws into one piece of legislation, it's not going to fix it. It's probably going to make it worse. The next logical step is actually for us to consider all these sectorial based pieces of legislation and policy and as humans work out how we connect them, not create a new one because we'll probably make similar mistakes. And, and we need to be more adaptable as well in how we go about administering them. And if you create a bigger law, you're probably going to have more difficulty with that. Um, so we, we kind of steer away from one, one law to rule them all. But what we also found is when we looked at EBM, we, we said, we, yep, we need more integrated approaches to management. We do. We need more collaborative approaches. We need, need to move away from sectorial and managerial. And actually, um, it's about building the relationships. And we called it relational EBM. We kind of got told off for that because EBM by definition is relational. But we, we're big believers in tell people what you're going to tell them, then tell them and then remind them what you told them. We need to do better at working together is the short thing. We're, so we want to be out here somewhere on, on, on the axes. Um, and similarly to earlier, what we heard earlier, EBM is a, a process of continuous and iterative improvement. It's not an end point. There is no end game here. These are structures for thinking and, and putting in place processes to continually allow us to adapt. Because ultimately we don't know what's going to come next, right? So ultimately, for us, EBM, a large part of it, because we focus on the M piece, um, mostly in law and policy, it's about relationship between people and places in the environment. Um, so it's an interesting take here, so good discussion point, you know. Um, yeah, absolutely, we need to put the environment first. But because we're people, we do that through people, so we do need to think about how we manage people and the activities and the effects of our activities in, in the place. Um, our next piece of research was, because we had to be thorough and produce empirical evidence for our findings, was looking at some examples around New Aotearoa. Um, and this was led by Steve and Steve Ehrlich and Hamish Rennie from Lincoln um, at existing legal and policy mechanisms at regional and national scales and how they worked. So most of this was in the fisheries and resource management area and a, and a little bit of MACA stuff. Um, and looking at the different scales that different pieces of legislation operated at and how they aligned or didn't. And funnily enough, the findings from that showed that the scales don't align. We have some real mismatches between our different pieces of legislation and policy. Um, so you can sometimes get contradictory outcomes. Um, it makes it really difficult because of those scale mismatches to manage places or what happens in places, I should actually say. Um, that said, these aren't barriers. They are opportunities, you know, because we can choose to, if there is the right will, to use those pieces of legislation differently. Um, it also highlighted, um, for the first time through empirical evidence, the need to better um, resource capability at, at smaller scales. And at that time we were talking regional, 
Today we're starting to say, well, we actually need a default, devolved decision making and management lower than regional even um, in, in many cases. Um, it, oh, come on, play along, because I, I really got a lot of slides and I can't afford to hesitate with them. <laughs> Our next piece of research was around um, we really looking at, at some of the later, the, at the evolution, not things that are in place, but some, where some of the thinking around policy development is actu actually going. Um, and, and some of the new methods that have been used, I guess, and this was led by Karen, um, and looked at different pieces of research that happened in, in um, sorry, different activities that had taken place in, in um, Kaipara, um, Ohiwa, um, Te Urui, and um, Whanganui River and, and, out of, and looked at what made those things successful and out of that Karen came up with four PO that are, I was going to read you the headline but I, um, to take us forward to enhance our within existing governance frameworks, this is what we say, when we say that, you know, they're not bad, they allow us to do these things um, that have happened in Kaipara and places, but we're not using them consistently. So what might be some of the enabling conditions that would an allow us to do these things more consistently? And we talked about um, interactive administrative arrangements rather than ad hoc, so actually getting on the front foot with these things. Um, focuses on interactive, dynamic and inclusive arrangements. So I'm not going to read all these because like you'll have access to the slides and at the end, anticipating running out of time, I've actually included all of our research outputs and the links to where to find them, both the academic articles and more importantly the end user summaries, um, which are a much better reading. So that was, that essentially ended up the first investigative phase of our research and we summarised that key observations at that point in time were there's a range of legal, to policy, legal policies and tools that already exist. Um, it's just that they're not consistently well implemented across space, time and different jurisdictions. Um, strategic approach versus this is where EBM finishes. Um, there is a shift in governments arrangements that is being informed and better aligning with Māori world, world views, which is Karen's work. But we need to resource these things better so that can be replicated around the country more. And we need to find ways to better develop use of underutilised legislation and policy. So once we got that half time, we, we kind of, internally at least, rewrote our research question <laughs> to how can law centre the health of oceans and related people in integrated decision making in a TDT compliant manner? So let's now move into how do we start to actually fix these things. I'm just going to keep talking, eh? Um, sim similar to Beth's work, we focused on, on four key areas of legislation because the legislative framework is so broad. We looked at fisheries, we looked at resource management, we looked at conservation slash biodiversity, and we looked at Māori and TDT rights. Um, we applied our earlier research learnings um, and, and how we would use those learnings to apply EBM across different spatial, time, boundaries and jurisdictional boundaries. And then we made some more, did some thinking, come up with some ideas, and then ran some, a series of workshops with um, central local government, industry stakeholders and hapu in place um, to, te to test our thinking. Um, we came out with this framework where we said 
we can we can actually make this work and 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 our um our relational ecosystem based framework for Aotearoa New Zealand has has opportunities in four key areas. We started off calling two of those areas hooks and anchors because it's just a good analogy with the sea, right? But then when we started to test the stuff with central government, they oh, we don't like hooks and anchors. It doesn't make any sense. We kind of thought anchors did because an anchors are, are, are um, things like the fundamental principles that we test everything against when we want to do something. Um, so you might say that tiriti should be an anchor, right? <laughs> and, and we also said that because... We are fragmented in implementation. Another good anchor might be to develop fundamental marine principles. So every time you make a decision in the ocean, it has to align and support one of the fundamental marine principles that are in place. We said it's not our job to define what those fundamental marine principles are, um, but you should do that. And, and by the way, it should be multi-led because there, there's just better thinking in that space than we can provide forth through, our, um, through where we are. So w once you've got those fundamental principles and anchors in place, um, and there's some international anchors in there as well um, that we have to be aware of because we have international responsibilities as a country, but once they're in place, then you need to develop the enabling conditions to go away and that become the second core focus of where we headed with our work um, and, and what those enabling conditions might, might be. Um, we think that we need a legal entity to represent the ocean. Um, we kind of think it doesn't make sense to have fisheries and oceans pushed together. Um, Fisheries, you know, as an industry, as a primary industry, you know, deserves to have its ministry in central government. But the oceans, at this point in time, needs a, a focus in and of itself for itself. Um, so we, we argue that a fundamental enabling condition should be a legal entity to represent the ocean of, in some shape or form. Could be a ministry, could be a commission, could be all sorts of things. I've got a slide that I can show you that where we assess the different options um, and essentially do a strength and weaknesses of, of each one and how, how that might look. Then our third enabling condition or third key, key, key po, if you like, in, in that context is actually the hooks. Um, and again, so the hooks were, what are the triggers in existing law and policy that we can hook into to make these things work. Um, again, feedback from central government, oh, we don't like this hook analogy. Um, so so c c c can you guys change that? Um, yeah, we can, because like it's only words. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's still the same thing. That's, that's, Kapai, if it works for you, that's good, because actually you're the people who we need to drive some of the stuff, because we're dealing with existing law and policy. Um, yeah, so our, our, our anchors became high-level policy objectives and our hooks <laughs> became sectorial rules, regulations and government arra governance arrangements. Hey, I, mean, I mean, that almost says enough, doesn't it? Um, but we can and we do. And, and so, again, I've got a table in my presentation that shows for our four jurisdictional elements, you know, the fisheries, uh, biodiversity, conservation, um, TDT Māori and environmental planning, because um, it changed from resource management to environmental planning, gone back again. Um, what the existing hooks are that we could actually utilise far better and consistently to move further towards EVM, what the developing ones are, because there's some fisheries is a really interesting space, and and people look at me like I'm a bit strange sometimes. Eh? Fisheries are doing some of the most innovative stuff um, in terms of policy development, but then it sits in someone's drawer and doesn't get used. Um,
But there's some developing policy work, guiding fra guidance frameworks and things in, in the fisheries space, that if we use those consistently around Aotearoa and New Zealand, you know, everyone would be better off. Um, and then we said, and here are some things that you really should be doing that aren't in existence yet, um, that you might really might want to consider as we transition or move forward. Um, and then the fourth key po that we came up with that sit over Karen's four po um, is enabling processes, which is actually okay. Then, so how do you tie all this stuff together? How can how can you actually do it better um, at a, at an operational level? A and went so far as to Five minutes. yeah um i could have just shown you my screen i guess i didn't actually <laughs> think of that eric's a bit slow sometimes um look at how those four key po interacted um and how it what it might actually look like structurally and functionally um so if you imagine that was a, a state to move to, what types of functions would exist to make that happen? Um, and, and so in addition to those, we came up with the notion of that, that you know, if you have a legal entity for the ocean, that's good. What's its actual function going to be? And who does it work with? And who, how does it relate with whom it needs to work with? And those types of things. Um, and we came up with a model for that. And so then we said, okay, then, actually our hooks now sectorial regulations and governance arrangements um, the legal entity for the ocean needs to be responsible for periodic and iterative reviews of those to make sure they can remain fit for purpose but that's actually also a role for the existing minis ministries and hope um, so how, how do those relationships work so explored how those relationships worked we looked at how you know if you say that inconsistency is an issue um, one of the things in the mobile